So uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with the space of cytoreductive nephrectomy and uh, some of the papers that are coming out in the space that we're still waiting for, uh, the Carmina and Sir time trials. And uh, so I'd like to focus around those trials and what other uh, retrospective data exists for cytoreductive nephrectomy. I was interested in this because during my chief I had a decent exposure to cytoreductive nephrectomy and had six distinct cases where patients presented with uh, synchronous metastatic RCC with uh, uh, various areas of metastatic uh, disease. And uh, I just put them together uh, just to summarize them here because uh, a lot of questions came up as I saw these patients. Uh, who, who's going to benefit from having this kidney removed at this point in time? How and when do we select which systemic therapy to start? And how do we optimally select patients? Are there patients that maybe could have been spared in nephrectomy because they weren't candidates? Or uh, I had no idea at the time. We're just operating during chief. But um, it's something I wanted to look at uh, in, in detail afterwards. And uh, we'll look at this again near the end, but just um, this is a pretty representative cohort of how these patients present nowadays. A lot of them are symptomatic because of their metastatic burden, especially with bone mets, uh, or presenting with uh, symptoms of advanced um, uh, local disease with hematuria flank pain. Uh, the primary size of these tumors are quite large now. We're moving away from uh, T1A and B uh, and T2 and moving into the T3, T4 type space when we're talking about metastatic RCC. Not uh, always, but often. The approach uh, to these cases, there was a variety open would make the most sense for these larger masses, but laparoscopic approach was amenable to, to a couple of these cases. And obviously there's a spectrum here of simple laparoscopic radical nephrectomy versus uh, requiring cardiac surgery and cold cardiac arrest uh, to perform a, a, a cable thrombectomy with the nephrectomy. Uh, of the patients that uh, I had experience with, uh, four of them um, had their primary therapy and then were followed with uh, sunitinib as a uh, systemic therapy. And two of these patients were on it pre-op. So how do we select which patients would benefit from having a, uh, a, a, um, a DKI <laughs> prior to nephrectomy versus after nephrectomy? And these questions aren't all that clear uh, in the literature. So we're talking in this uh, talk specifically about synchronous metastatic RCC. Uh, and those are patients that present with metastatic burden of disease and a primary tumor. And uh, despite the stage migration in RCC, we're still seeing uh, a good number of patients, uh, almost a stable number that are presenting. And some series quoting up to 30% of patients that present uh, with RCC, which as we know is innately chemo <coughs> and, and radiation resistant, although I saw some controversy on that. And that's why we're in the era of targeted therapies as the optimal treatment for, for these tumors. And very early studies, case reports, uh, and very small case series in the 70s and 80s hinted at uh, improved patient outcomes in those that ended up going, uh, undergoing treatment for the primary tumor. Um, but again, there's a lot of uh, uh, heterogeneity in these cases. But there are some papers that describe complete responses when cytoreductive nephrectomy was combi combined with steroid alone. So this has been a well-recognized phenomenon for some time of removing the primary. So cytoreductive surgery, just as a definition here, it is the resection of the primary gross tumor, despite the acknowledged presence of concomitant clinically detectable and synchronous uh, metastatic disease. And we're seeing increasing use throughout oncology, specifically in urology as well, in testis and even in prostate. There's uh, increasing evidence uh, for control of the primary in the oligometastatic state. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, and I didn't want to get into it too much, but uh, it will be on another slide. And so we're specifically saying we're operating without curative intent, but there may be benefits to operating, specifically um, reducing the tumor burden that systemic treatment has to uh, attack, improving overall survival, which is a new uh, recognized thing associated with performing cytoreductive surgery. Uh, especially in RCC, potentially improve the immunologic and host responses to the tumor itself and to metastatic sites once the primary tumor is out. Uh, especially in a, uh, in a very heterogeneous disease like RCC, providing maximal tissue for analysis versus just a biopsy can uh, perhaps help guide treatment, especially in, in subsequent eras and what's coming up in the future. And then the oldest reason, which is to provide, prophylact to provide palliation but performing a cytoreductive nephrectomy can, prof can provide prophylactic pr uh, palliation if one would expect hematuria, flank pain, et cetera, from the size of the renal mass. 
this is just one slide on the, the mechanisms of benefit of cytoreduction, which uh, I gather are largely unknown. There's a lot of theories, but it's not been in, shown very clearly why it works, that so you can remove the primary and sometimes even have regression of some metastatic sites. So certainly it's a reduction in the bulk of disease that will need treatment after the primary tumor is out. Uh, RCC specifically, there's uh, increasing evidence that it's an immunologic tumor, as we know with these new papers coming up that uh, I think Ben even reviewed in his highlights, showing uh, uh, checkpoint inhibition in RCC and that it's rekindling the uh, immunoresponsiveness of RCC and immune treatments. And um, the RCC might act like an immunosuppressive sink, uh, allowing uh, metastatic sites distant um, to the actual primary to proliferate, mediating the inability of the immune system to adequately treat them. Uh, there are earlier studies as well that have tried to show that uh, it changes in the immune cell cohorts of the patients can change uh, pre-surgery and following nephrectomy. And there's been descriptions that these uh, defects in natural killer cells or in certain types of cytotoxic lymphocytes improve. And these defects go away <coughs> once the primary kidney is removed in the setting of metastatic disease. Uh, and so um, uh, there's obviously a lot of research needed for this, but there is a clear clinical benefit with phase three trials showing that there's a benefit of doing this. So whatever the underlying mechanism is, it certainly does, does work. Um, when reviewing cytoreductive nephrectomy, there's the common ages that are described, the dark age and what existed before that. Uh, then the modern age, which is what we're transitioning out of now into the golden age, which is that rekindling of immunotherapy for, for RCC. And then there's this diamond age, uh, which doesn't seem too far away. But you can see on these Kaplan-Meier curves, the dotted lines are the, uh, the hypothesized outcome in the future. And there's huge uh, shifts that are being expected. This was uh, a European urology review on the topic. And um, there we go. So this is showing that the, the survival from the dark ages to the uh, modern age is, you know, in, it, there's certainly a benefit, but it's incremental. But the expectations over the coming ages of the golden age and the diamond age of precision oncology are huge with uh, people expecting... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, the papers were saying uh, they're expecting 80% 10-year survival for metastatic RCC. We're leaving the modern age and we're entering the golden age. We're leaving the ages, the ages, the language of science as well. Yeah. Projections that are. Yeah, certainly a, a long way to go till we reach what they're anticipating in, in that diamond age. So um, just brief review of cytoreductive nephrectomy through the years. So pre-1990, this is when we're talking about uh, CN as a palliative approach. So patients presenting with large tumors ended up having the kidney removed simply because of pain, hematuria, or to control perineoplastic sim symptoms. But the nephrectomy itself isn't done to confer a uh, survival advantage. And we knew that in this time there are anecdotal evidence that there was benefit to doing it. Uh, then in the cytokine era, um, which ended around 2005, there's two key studies that are always cited and good exam fodder. Uh, both one of them is a SWOG and the other one is the EORTC trial, which both showed significant overall survival and improved progression-free survival for patients that had cytonephrectomy first up front, followed by, uh, sorry, that had cytonephrectomy first, sorry, uh, followed by cytokine therapy in the form of interferon alpha. And uh, we'll have those Kaplan-Myers in a second. But importantly, these two studies highlighted uh, two important uh, points that are commonly described as reasons against performing a cytoreductive nephrectomy. And the first is, is that uh, they both show very low perioperative mortality, that these patients can safely undergo nephrectomy. And uh, secondly, for the MedOnc side of things, over 90% of patients were able to receive systemic therapy after uh, CN, which is another cited reason that uh, performing the nephrectomy would um, cause too much of a delay before you can provide the uh, systemic therapy in the, uh, with targeted therapy. But these are, this was done in the cytokine era. So the, these were the two papers, and uh, they did a combined meta-analysis, and again, suggest high-level evidence. There is an overall survival to doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy first, followed by uh, um, cytokine therapy. Now, uh, here it's important to note, in all these groups and in a lot of these studies going forward, there seems to be an initial subset of patients that are rapidly progressive. So that early part of these, both, uh, these two curves regardless of whether they were patients were randomized to CN and then systemic therapy or just systemic therapy alone, the curves pretty much overlap in the first few months. Um, and so it just highlights that there are patients that are rapid progressors 
and um, they may not benefit from a nephrectomy to begin with, which might lend evidence to providing the systemic therapy first, then uh, a nephrectomy, and we'll touch on that later. So that's check marked off for the dark age. And uh, now in the modern age, do we have similar studies that can show that cytoreductive nephrectomy is, is beneficial? And uh, we do, and they're currently ongoing, but they have not reported yet. So the, this whole wealth of evidence that's existing in this age for cytoreductive nephrectomy is heavily based on retrospective studies, which do have their own biases, um, despite showing overall survival advantages. So uh, the, the big thing is this, the Carmina and the Sir time trial, which we'll discuss. And other than those two studies, which have not reported level one evidence, uh, there is nothing else. Everything else is retrospective, large cohort population-based studies. Um, and these retrospective studies do show benefits, but again, it's difficult to answer those nuanced questions on exact patient selection, optimizing timing of therapy, which simply aren't answered by those retrospective studies. Uh, so this uh, this uh, graph just shows the transition from that uh, the uh, uh, dark era to the modern era uh, in treatment of metastatic RCC. Those two red um, circles are over the IL-2 and interferon alpha, which were mainstays of treatment prior to 2005. And then once serafinib and then soon after sunitinib were approved in 2005-2006, there was a rapid rise in the use of those agents, a massive drop-off in the use of the uh, cytokine therapy, but also a decreasing use of cytoreductive nephrectomy as that space had no evidence. And um, we're seeing great, good, more good responses to systemic therapy, which in some patients never led to any, uh, any cytoreductive nephrectomy. So these are just the brief schematics for the two trials um, that are very important in the space, Carmina and Sirtime. So Carmina um, uh, randomized patients to have immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy followed by sunitinib versus sunitinib just up front with no intention of performing cytoreductive nephrectomy. And it would answer the question of whether upfront nephrectomy is worth it, just like in that um, in the cytokine era. The Sirtime study answered the question of timing. Um, now, should patients have the nephrectomy up front followed by sunitinib or a few cycles of sunitinib first with some of the advantages that may confer, like downsizing the tumor size, making sure that you're selecting the appropriate patients that respond, and then having patients move to nephrectomy followed by uh, uh, resumption of, cert of uh, sunitinib afterwards. Now, the problem is that Sirtime uh, was underpowered and closed early, and Carmina is taking a long time to accrue and the, has not reported yet. And I think I've read um, some papers saying that we can expect to see results 2018 to 2020. Um, even that might be a stretcher. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's quite some time. And as we're saying, we're moving out of this era. So um, there's no level one evidence guiding the use of the current uh, standard of care tar uh, targeted so therapy agents. Power power power. Oh, yeah. Power. That's what I was just about to say here. So this is what I could find on Sir Time uh, from ASCO. Uh, and it stated that they had poor accrual, and so the the study at its current per, um, accrual was only studied was only powered, sorry, to reflect a progression-free rate at 28 weeks versus reporting a progression-free survival uh, in longer-term follow-up. And they had 99 patients and were attempting to accrue 400 plus or three somewhere in that range. So what they reported is that their in their median follow-up of 3.3 years, there was no difference in the progression-free rate between the two groups, those that had cytoreductive nephrectomy first, followed by uh, therapy, or those that had uh, deferred CN. There was a, an overall uh, survival benefit in the deferred group, but the numbers were too low that uh, they couldn't conclude anything from it. But the numbers that they reported in this abstract, I didn't include them just because they seemed a little bit controversial. Uh, there, was, there was quite an extreme difference in the deferred group in terms of overall survival. But they themselves say that because of the small numbers and everything, they can't conclude anything from that. So I didn't include it in here. Uh, so this study, then Sirtime, it, it doesn't answer the question of uh, the, the order of uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy and systemic therapy which is, is frustrating because that's a, a big question left to answer. And uh, Carmina, I, uh, we just mentioned, is still accruing, but very slow accrual. A uh, big example they use is in the UK with such strong trial infrastructure. They've recruited 14 patients over four years, which is remarkably low, and it's, it's, it's unclear why. And maybe that's an area we can discuss. 
Um, and as I said, hoping that we can still and get results from this study in the coming years. But before you pause there and just ask, why is it challenging to recruit this, this question? Does it have any proof set? Well, with, uh, with search time, the biggest issue was that patients keep coming to us or the more certain we were given the option, mm -hmm. even though there's really no real clinical support, we don't know which ones better. Mm -hmm. they, Always choose for uh, the other problem is that in the community we don't get the most reports. So theoretically, we should be having more. We do have one for chronic attrition. Um, we divert a lot of these to us. A lot are missed and treated up front with surgery after a while. So mm -hmm. those are two big issues. Mm -hmm. We also have to be completely asymptomatic. So we start asking the patients and discriminatory trial of all the patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big thing. There was apparently a, they sent out a survey of uh, 20 patients. I think um, I think most of the majority of them were eligible for the Carmina trial, and they asked the providers, what would you recommend trial versus some type of therapy? And the vast majority of people recommended some type of therapy and didn't suggest to put that patient on trial. So um, the, there certainly is issues with recruiting for such an important study uh, that you know we need answers to. And so this was just some editorial piece that said that as we're moving out of this generation into the, the second generation of RCC immunotherapy, this might be a question that never gets answered. And then the question remains in now this new uh, immunotherapy generation, what is the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy? And how is it best uh, um, added in to the armamentarium of systemic agents? So now we're looking, unfortunately, at a lot of retrospective data, which has a lot of biases, especially uh, biases in terms of time from uh, diagnosis of metastatic RCC to treatment, uh, sorry, diagnosis to referral to the appropriate center, and then time to actual treatment. And so there's a lot of um, time that simply cannot be accounted for properly in these retrospective studies. But nonetheless, with good numbers and querying strong databases, there still seems to be uh, clear evidence for an overall survival benefit for cytoreductive nephrectomy uh, with uh, some over 10 months, but obviously the biases we'll get into. Um, this study, this retrospective study by Heng, um, looked at the criteria that would suggest good response and poor response to cytoreductive nephrectomy, and using their previously validated uh, IMDC uh, criteria, six criteria, to predict uh, poor prognosis in metastatic RCC, they found that patients that had four or more of these factors derived no benefit from cytoreductive nephrectomy. And that stands to reason that if you have a surgically fit you know, patient with low burden metastatic disease and high performance status, they likely would benefit from, from surgery, whereas a patient with a lot of these uh, adverse features might not. And that's what these retrospective studies are uh, highlighting. Uh, this was uh, uh, one of the largest uh, meta-analysis looking at all retrospective studies in this space. And again, that overall hazard ratio for the overall survival is, is, is clear, 0.46. Um, and again, it highlights those same factors that patients with a poor for performance status, uh, brain or liver mets, and sarcomatoid differentiation on uh, histology uh, are do poorly with cytoreductive nephrectomy. Uh, this study was interesting in that a few of these um, retrospective studies actually quantify how much of the tumor burden was debulked at nephrectomy, and that can become a relevant uh, criteria to look at in a patient that has uh, oligometastatic disease where removing the primary will remove the bulk of the tumor. Those patients also seem to respond the most uh, to cytoreductive nephrectomy versus those where if you remove the primary, the vast majority of the tumor is still left behind tend not to, to benefit as much. And in this paper, in this meta-analysis, it was 75% burden, but others have shown even more needs to be taken out. Uh, and so, yeah, here, here's one of them. It just shows that the more you can remove of the, the tumor bulk, the, the greater the progression-free survival rate is. And that makes sense. And um, here, if you have patients with stable disease after uh, removing the bulk of the tumor, metastatic deposit, or the primary, uh, you can actually delay the onset of administration of the TKI, which might give, again, more longevity of treatment. But you know, yeah. It's so self-evident as to why that data is there. I mean, if, if the tumor is resectable, of course, it, you know, it can lend itself to better outcome. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what you're 
suggestion that you're making a difference when hmm. the difference is all you know, predetermined. And uh, just from a presentation point of view, it's, uh, it's, it provides a, a way to evidence that it doesn't exist. I mean, this percentage of tumor removed, is that percentage of the primary or percentage of the total body burden? Percentage of the total burden of tumor. So it would include the metastatectomy for some patients. Yeah, it's it's very hard to measure, but you know, with CT and resist criteria, they they are able to quantify it. But if you have a patient trying to you can try to get a less than ninety percent recovery chance. But it's it, it's it's just a way it I think one thing, they, one thing they were getting at uh, was that if you have a patient with a very small primary but a heavy burden of metastatic disease, even if that small primary is very amenable to resection, those patients might not uh, benefit or have a smaller uh, period of time before they show progression, which also stands to reason. So, again, not that uh, high quality evidence. Uh, this was one of the largest retrospective studies not included in that meta-analysis because it's, uh, it's newer. And it again sh uh, confirms what, uh, what uh, the other studies are showing, that the factors associated with cytoreductive nephrectomy benefit from it are younger age, academic center, privately insured, lower T stage, and clinically node negative patients. So a picture seems to be uh, emerging that those younger patients uh, with uh, low burden of metastatic disease where removing that primary can actually debulk a lot of their uh, whole tumor burden would benefit from having this type of therapy. Once again, the median overall survival in this large uh, retrospective study uh, was quite longer for patients that underwent CN versus those that, uh, that did not. And in their study, 89% um, of uh, cytoreductive nephrectomies were performed prior to the onset of systemic therapy, like the phase three trials in the uh, um, cytokine era. Uh, but it, interestingly, the numbers are too small to, to really comment on, in that 11% that received delayed cytoreductive nephrectomy, those patients had an even larger overall survival benefit. So again, it might hint at um, staggering therapies, beginning with a targeted agent nephrectomy and then continuing that agent um, after the patient recovers from surgery. So in the, in the modern era, uh, this was one paper that uh, actually contradicted a lot of other papers uh, talking about the use of a CN. This paper, um, which uh, I think it was SEER database, large numbers, they showed that there was, in fact, an increase in use of cytoreductive nephrectomy over time, uh, well into the, the current era, um, which, contra which conflicted with a lot of results from other studies saying that it was going down. And in their study, they were showing that over time, especially now, uh, post-2010, uh, 2011, uh, patients uh, are having reasonable length of stays in hospital and reasonable perioperative uh, risk um, with an average length of stay of five days, which is reasonable in this, in this space. Once again, this study, like all the other retrospective studies, confirmed that the survival advantage conferred by CN is lost when patients have poor performance status, increased age. In terms of uh, complication rates, they're quite low um, and, and nothing that would be higher than obviously radical nephrectomy in a non-metastatic setting, but certainly <coughs> tolerable, especially if, if there is such an overall survival that can be conferred with, with CN. Once again here, um, uh, highest risk of operative complications for the patients were seen in those that had lo advanced local disease, especially tumor thrombi. Liver mets uh, also portends a poor prognosis. Uh, for these patients. Uh, here in terms of time to therapy uh, in, in this study, you can see a lot of patients are followed by surveillance after their cytoreductive nephrectomy and that's because they have stable disease or even regression of some of their metastatic disease following treatment of the primary, which is, which is a phenomenon that is seen uh, and was documented in those very, very early studies. So only 40% of the patients that got systemic therapy actually got it within what's considered a reasonable time frame, which is 60 days. Um, but uh, the, the authors of this paper state that the delay to systemic <coughs> therapy in their study was not related to surgical factors like wound healing or post-operative complications, but more associated with factors of uh, just inability to deliver therapy at a reasonable time and patients being lost. And uh, in, in their study, 
earlier administration of systemic therapy was associated with patients that had a uh, burden of metastasis in the lung only uh, and those that had a laparoscopic approach, uh, both of which stand to reason. Once again, like the, all the other retrospective studies, uh, older age and in this one positive node status actually uh, was associated with delayed uptake of uh, systemic therapy. So the, what, what's recommended in, in guidelines? There are no guidelines based on level one evidence in this space, obviously, because that um, evidence is lacking. Uh, but the EA, EAU does say, state that uh, systemic therapy tends to be offered first, just in the way these patients get triaged. Uh, but in patients that uh, are young, have good performance status, low, low burden METs, and it's not on here, but respond or have stable disease when started on uh, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, they should be offered uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy as they're the ones to likely benefit. And in 2015, there was an update on uh, from the Canadian uh, kidney cancer uh, consensus update. And um, once again, they're relying heavily on the fact that there's level one evidence in the earlier era and that CN should be considered a standard of care uh, in patients with metastatic RCC and those favorable factors uh, in terms of timing, though, the Canadian guidelines don't answer that specifically and just state that um, in patients that have a good response to targeted therapy, uh, CN should be considered in the course of their treatment. So where that actually lies in the course of their treatment is very much up in the air and uh, unfortunately wasn't answered by some of the other trials. Uh, interestingly, uh, the question of lymph node dissection and whether that contributes to overall tumor bulk when you're talking about metastatic disease burden, there are a couple of papers that um, interestingly showed negative um, effects of performing a lymph node dissection even in patients that were known uh, N positive. And it resulted in, that resulted in all those classic effects like a delay to systemic therapy, uh, regardless of the, whether it was a template or just a pick and grab of obvious metastatic disease. Uh, it was not associated with any um, over, with improved uh, cancer-specific survival. And in this recent study in CUAJ, performing a formal lymph node dissection, which they defined as having greater than three nodes, um, was actually associated with decreased cancer-specific survival. And other papers have also shown that, that a metastatic RCC undergoing a lymphadenectomy doesn't confer any, any benefit, which I thought is a very interesting, uh, yeah, very interesting clinical phenomenon. And there's a paper in European Urology uh, this year that apparently is showing no benefit of lymph node dissection even in locally advanced M0 disease. So um, that's a very interesting topic to, to discuss, uh, the role of uh, performing lymphadenectomy in these settings, especially when there's evidence that metastatic deposits certainly do count in terms of that uh, uh, overall burden of disease. And the longest overall survival in this context seems to be patients that have oligomets, so on, uh, defined as under three sites, that are amenable to complete resection, which usually implies that they're in the uh, adrenal uh, lesion, ipsilateral or contralateral, uh, lung and resectable, or in the bone, and are technically resectable with radiation, especially stereotactic radiation. Uh, the complete removal of clinical mets in these patients resulted in a five-year cancer-specific survival of 50% versus much lower if the removal was incomplete, even if it was 90%. Uh, this obviously represents a very highly selected group of patients that have all those favorable risk criteria, and then on top of that, do have low-volume metastatic disease and sites amenable for resection. Uh, but there is evidence that chasing those metastatic deposits, if they are amenable to resection, can confer an overall survival benefit but for some reason, lymph node uh, dissection does not. And there is an active phase three trial uh, in this uh, setting that's randomizing patients that uh, do fulfill all those criteria that undergo a treatment of the primary and metastatectomy. So they would technically have totally resected disease and they are randomized to receive observation, uh, placebo or uh, pazopinib, um, looking at disease-free survival as the primary outcome. So in terms of the timing, uh, one of the big arguments for initiating uh, the targeted agent initially followed by a cytoreductive nephrectomy would be uh, to assess the, the ability for, um, uh, for response. And patients that do tend to respond to uh, cytokine therapy, uh, sorry, um, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, especially those that show a significant response in the reduction in size of the primary tumor, um, tend to do the best. And so in, in this study, they're using the resist criteria. And I guess uh, based on this graph here, 
um, partial response by resist criteria is defined as a change in a specific uh, uh, lesion uh, that can be followed on serial imaging of 30% or more. And so these authors defined a new point which they call the minor response which is 10% uh, reduction in size and uh, they state that if the primary tumor had a 10% reduction in size uh, that those patients said uh, the best and any, any type of response of these metastatic lesions was also an independent predictor of overall survival. So um, the, the starting that targeted agent initially might really uh, allow us to select the optimal patients to then undergo uh, surgical resection of the primary plus minus metastatic disease burden if they're a candidate. Uh, Similar to those very early studies that described the role of performing the nephrectomy alone, uh, this was one study that uh, um, had patients with metastatic RCC undergo a cytoreductive nephrectomy. And then they classified these patients as either responders or non-responders based on serial imaging over the subsequent three months. And uh, this is without administering any systemic therapy and just delaying it until there's evidence of progression. And it stands to reason But those patients where you re remove the primary tumor and there's evidence of response in their metastatic sites or stable disease at those sites, um, they have a greater overall survival. And more importantly, uh, the time to initiate the targeted agent can be drawn out and can be delayed. And um, that can also confer, uh, minimize the risks associated with the agent, but also confer a survival benefit uh, to these patients. And uh, the longer systemic free, uh, with, uh, there was a longer time period before initiating therapy, especially if patients had metastatectomy. So this is again that picture of the patients that have resectable disease, both primary and metastatic, are uh, completely free of any obvious gross disease. And uh, these patients are the ones that are doing the best and can uh, be withheld from initiating a targeted agent for the longest period of time. So without the, the guidance from time, the, the evidence that we're relying on in terms of a cytoreductive nephrectomy up front versus a few cycles of systemic agent um, is, is unclear in dealer's choice. But there are a lot of papers that describe that initial round of targeted therapy as a litmus test for response. And uh, especially in Europe, it appears that most patients with metastatic RCC tend to be started on a, a targeted agent first prior to being assessed by a surgeon for uh, to, to determine surgical resection. Whereas here, especially in, in what I saw, a lot of these patients tend to come from directly from GPs. And so we might uh, have a bias to perform the cytoreductive nephrectomy up front. But nonetheless, it, it seems like uh, giving these patients a trial of the systemic therapy and determining their response can really help tease out those patients that would be real um, candidates for cytoreductive nephrectomy. And so that, uh, yeah. 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 But that's the thing. A lot of these retrospective studies uh, are showing that cytoreductive nephrectomy independently can confer an overall survival sure, benefit, like, right? Responded, let's go for it, and let's take out the primary now. Yeah. You know, like, like it's all going down the same path. But I guess that's what will be answered in Carmina, right? Yeah. Of, uh, but like, if you're not even responding to a CKI, what's the point of that? Yeah, exactly. And that's why up front, that patient shouldn't be offered a nephrectomy because they're destined to fail anyways. Sure. So that's where the argument comes of trialing that targeted agent. Because it's language, but the retrospective studies suggest there may be a benefit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can't say that retrospective studies show that there is a benefit. Correct. Yeah, and absolutely. That's why, if they did, we wouldn't be sitting there going through all this data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very true. But I guess just trying to uh, enhance that discrimination uh, is, is, the, is the only key point there. And uh, one thing I wanted to discuss here, because I couldn't find uh, that evidence online, but in Carmina, especially if the standard of care as recommended by the Canadian Kidney Cancer uh, Guidelines and the EAU are suggesting that we are going to be doing cytoreductive nephrectomy and it has a benefit. 
is there going to be an effect of contamination in Carmina Arms? There's the yeah. Yeah, and we've already pretty much lost our time, uh, and so again, in this space, it's very interesting that we're in this era of using these targeted agents and performing cytoreductive nephrectomies, uh, but. You know, the evidence and these key studies are very difficult to, to move forward. So Sir Time did not answer that question of timing. And again, this Carmina, I, uh, not only uh, issues from newer studies that are coming out, which are going to draw patients away, but uh, I didn't get a sense of these patients that are on sunitinib, if they did have a good response, um, how, come, how many of them may have uh, pursued undergoing surgical resection themselves and contaminated themselves uh, for inclusion into the study. So that, that was uh, just a brief review of, of the of cytoreductive nephrectomy that the increasing retrospective data suggests here, I use the right word, an overall benefit, <laughs> overall benefit uh, to performing cytoreductive nephrectomy in the metastatic setting. Um, and clinical guidelines are supporting the use of CN, but we're waiting and may never really get level one evidence, especially with regards to how to best manage uh, uh, these patients in terms of timing of agents. Cytoreductive nephrectomy definitely appears safe with acceptable perioperative risks of uh, morbidity and mortality, but it's patient selection that remain the, the absolute uh, paramount factors um, in optimizing patient outcomes. And all this might be mute because the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy might change again as we enter this golden age and the diamond age of RCC management. And uh, it may completely fall out of place or it may find an even more prominent role. And uh, that's left to be seen, but certainly we need the evidence to, to support ourselves. Thanks.